everyone, my name is Bruce Smith and welcome to another edition of Fly Fishing in Nature's Realm. Now um, in this episode um, I'm going to discuss tactics um, for the beginner, for the first timer, for that person that's never fly fished before and he's having a hard time. Now I'm going to talk tactics um, and probably the greatest tactic of all time in fly fishing, in my opinion, is observation. All right? Observation is the key. So the first tactic in observation is to watch the water. Observe the water, guys. All right? When you get to a lake or a river and you are going to start to fly fish, don't rush in there and just start fishing away. All right, that's totally the worst thing that you can do. What you should do is to watch the water for a good 15 minutes, minimum. All right, select a rock, a log, sit in the tussock grass. All right, just relax, stand back, and watch that water. Now, in that time frame, you may see trout start to rise. You may start to see insects hatching. You might start to see a whole host of different things that might occur that can allow you to start fly fishing. But also within that 15 minutes, we might not see anything at all. And what does that tell us? Well, we're gonna to have to start to blind fish, all right? Now, blind fishing is where we don't know where the trout are, okay? And we start fishing a certain area. But with other tactics, we can reduce the chances in our favour, okay, um, through, again, in the line of observation. Now watch this short little video um, on watching the water. Right. So let's head off down to the lake. All right, listen to the frogs, incredible. This is fantastic. All right, now, what I'm gonna talk about today is observation. And observation is probably the most critical part of being successful in fly fishing. We don't want to rush in and start fishing our perspective area straight away. We want to sit back, stand back and watch for a good 10, 15 minutes. Because if you just go straight into the water, you could actually spook a lot of trout. So we need to sit back and watch. And even listen. Isn't that just magic? That frog just incredible. Geez, I love that. So let's just watch for a while and we'll see what happens. Now the water clarity is probably 90% clear, a little bit of uh, a little bit of dirt in there, mainly due to um, the recent rains that we've had and it's filled this lake right up to 100% and um, 
it's just great for the lake it really is so basically the lake's very clear and as you can see the weather conditions are bright and sunny and very very light when almost no wind whatsoever from the east and this is the eastern shoreline of New Orleans so um, we'll continue to watch and observe this is what you've got to do to be successful I'll see you in a few minutes okay now the next part of observation when we don't know that there's trout within our lake or the river that we're fishing is observation of aquatic insects all right now the first tactic you want to do to put you yourself in the best position is to know what insects are about at that time of the year so the seasons okay if it's springtime we could possibly have mayfly we could have damsel flies hatching um, summertime could be caddis okay um, summertime could also be um, midges all right midges could come on during the warmer weather as well so we're narrowing down the actual um, fly that we might select to blind fish within a certain area mud eyes autumn all right they basically come out late summer autumn so there's different times where the insects will show themselves so knowing that is a great indication of what fly to select now knowing the terrain or the habitat of these insects that do come out we've got my, uh, mayfly uh, they will be mainly found under rocks it's not the only thing that uh, that they uh, inhabit uh, they, they under woody debris um, and also um, a little bit in wheat beds but the main habitat of mayflies are rocks okay so knowing where those rocks are within a lake on a river on a, a river that we're fishing is going to be a good indication for you to go fish that area damselflies you'll mainly find damselflies in weed beds so if this area has a lot of weed beds that's a key indication that damselflies and an imitation for it is the best one Mud eyes, under woody debris, under submerged logs, under submerged trees. That's where we'll find our mud eyes, okay? And midges, they love a mud bottom in most, most species of midges, okay? So if we come to an area that's barren of any weed beds, that's barren of rocks, but it could have a good uh, population of chromatid or midges. So that's what we look for okay so we would get into the water and we'd lift up those rocks we'd lift we'd look in those weed beds and then when we get the greatest number of those insects we select the fly all right now the fly that we select needs to be an imitation of the greatest number of that insect so the fly needs to be correct in size shape and color okay and that's very important and that's just your basics you know there are some flies out there that absolutely look a hundred percent like the insect and they're great to use but it doesn't have to be that particular all right just size shape and color will get you by okay so looking for aquatic insects is a big one all right or observation of aquatic insects now we come to observation of terrestrial insects so they're the insects that border our lakes and streams that are get blown onto the water um, that fall into the water from trees and from bushes now if we look at some of the common terrestrial insects grasshoppers all right we'll find grasshoppers in grassy edges along the river or around the lake and the wind will blow them into the water um, beetles they'll be mainly found in trees and in bushes again wind is the main uh, persuader to push those 
um, beetles into the water. And ants are another one, again, on trees, on the ground, all right? And again, wind is a big factor in putting those insects into the water or onto the water. And again, like with aquatic insects, when we see the greatest number, and it could be, say, grasshoppers uh, in absolute thousands along a river stream, that's the fly we would select to imitate a grasshopper. So we'd select the fly, and we need to select the fly that looks like the grasshopper in size, shape, and color. All right? Very important. All right, let's watch this little bit of film footage in regards to observation of aquatic insects and terrestrial insects. All right, and we're given the uh, well, this area probably about 15 minutes of watching and observing. And I haven't seen any trout rise, haven't seen any, or haven't polaroided any trout. And um, the only thing I have observed is a lot of insects are starting to hatch, there's midges, and um, that's the next most important thing in observation is observing what insects are about because they'll tell you what fly to put on and what fly to start fishing now the only insects I've seen hatching is midges there's damsel flies about so the damsel nymphs are obviously scurrying from the, you know, the deeper sections of the lake up to the shallows and hatching out into the, to the damsel fly and even a few dragonflies are about so that means the mud eyes are hatching as well so observing that would tell you to put on a damsel nymph fly because the damsel nymphs or even a mud eye pattern they would be scurrying about in the uh, in the section of the, the lake here probably or wherever they're about so that's what I'm going to do I'm going to select myself a damsel nymph. Now, here's a damsel nymph pattern that I've got here. It's a um, partridge feather tail with olive green seal fur, pheasant tail wing case with black bead eyes. And um, this is a brilliant pattern. It's a long shank uh, size 10, and um, it's a great one to search for any trout that might be about. So observation has shown us what fly to put on and that's what you'll get from nature. It's nature. If you study nature you will learn all about fly fishing. Nature will show you how to fly fish. So let's give this nymph a little bit of a fish. Alright now, I've got myself into position, I'm going to start fishing this damsel nymph. Now with a little damsel nymph that I've got on, you just want to either figure of eight or very short strips. I sort of vary it a bit between short strips and figure of eight. Just short little strips. If there's a trout around, you should get an investigation or a hit. Got myself a tiny trout. Must be a newly released trout. But he took that damsel on there. Look at him leaping. <laughs> That's fantastic, isn't it? Unreal. But yeah, um, God. I don't think they make them that small, do they? Jeez, he's fighting well. So there we have it. Nice little brown trout for the look of him. And uh, there he is. <laughs> Jeez, how small is he? Oh my god. But he took that damsel nymph. And there it is. By observing what food items and insects are around will tell you what fly to put on and then you can catch a trout like this little bloke 
Let's see if we can catch the bigger one. Let's put him back. See you later, mate. And he's gone. Alright, continuing on. Our next observation tactic is observation of insect life cycles. Now, in a previous video, guys, I showed you the life cycle of the mayfly and all its different stages. It's imperative that you know all the stages of the insect life cycle. So you need to know all the insects. Now, there's a lot of insects out there. Now, what I endeavoured to do is I've done one on mayfly, I'll do one on caddis, I'll do one on damselflies, I'll do one on uh, dragonflies, I'll do one on chromatid, all right? I'll have future videos explaining the different life cycles of the insects and the different stages and what flies to use and again, what presentations we need to give to those flies. But it's a big part of observation, guys, is to observe the life cycles and know all the stages. That is imperative. Okay, our next tactic is observation of trout rise forms. Okay, now as we know, trout when they feed, they can show um, different rise forms that can be a key indication as to what they're feeding on. Now, let's take a look at the different rise forms. First rise form is a normal rise. This is where a trout comes up, just sucks an insect off the surface and creates a ring, okay? It's great. We know straight away that the trout are feeding and we know it took something off the water surface, all right? And that's probably as far as it goes as to indications and, uh, and its helpfulness in regards to that. But a lot of the other ones can be very um, telling into what they're feeding on these trout. Okay, the next one is a surface boil. Now, as you remember in my life cycle talk on the mayfly, we talked about the emerging nymph. Now, the emerging nymph sits right in the surface film or just under the surface film. And what happens is a trout will come up, he'll take that insect, he won't break the surface, and he will zip back down and as he does his tail flips up and creates a boil on the surface of the, uh, uh, the water surface. So you see that that is a key indication that the trout are on a emerging insect. Not necessarily a mayfly, it could be a caddis, it could be a whole host of different insects but we know at what stage that insect's at and that can be a key indicator to what fly to select. So a surface boil is a very important one if you do so. Tailing trout, all right? It's not actually a rise form, but tailing trout is where we see trout in that shallow of water that their dorsal fin showing, their adipose fin showing, and their back fins showing as well. And sometimes you can even see the top of their heads they're in that shallow water. And what they'll be doing is grubbing around um, on the bottom, right? Feeding on, it could be crustaceans. Uh, it could be, you know, uh, little aquatic beetles, or it could be scud, um, um, shrimp, those type of things. Um, and a lot of lakes will have their shallows um, and trout feeding within those shallows. Um, one that's sort of celebrated in a big way is Little Pine Lagoon. You see the trout there going after the um, prehistoric little uh, 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 shrimp there that uh, they feed on and they really show their backs, their tails. It's so easy guys and it's a key indication of what fly to use and how to present it. And it's not easy, let me tell you. You've really got to put in a, a presentation that's not going to spook those trout. Very hard indeed. But it's a telltale sign of a feeding trout and what they're doing. Next one, a jumping rise. Well, when the trout leap out of the water and they're taking something within the air, it's going to be pretty hard to catch them, guys. All right? So, you know, I wouldn't be too fussed on that. But it's a key indication of what stage. So within the mayfly, 
we see the trout looping through the air and taking the spinners, well then we know that they are taking the spinners during their reproduction and that the next stage of the mayfly is not too far away. So it can give you not direct um, indications, but indirect indications, which can be very important. Head and tail rise. That again is where a trout has taken something to the very, right in the very surface film, but this time it's taken it and it could indicate a bigger type insect because its tail has been exposed, it's broken the water or its dorsal fin, all right? It still hasn't taken something above the surface, but something under there, but it's breaking that tension or that water tension, all right? So a head and tail rise is a good indication to a lot of different insects. A splashy rise, well, in this indication, it's talking about insects that are moving quickly. Uh, trying to escape quickly. A key one there would be the mayfly um, when it changes from the emerging nymph to the dun on a real windy day. When you have a real windy day the wind will dry their wings very quickly almost instantaneously their wings will dry and they'll be off as a dun and when they're off like that the trout have got a limited time to take them so they'll make a splashy rise to try and grab them so that's a real good indicator uh, that type of rise form. And then we have a crashing rise. Okay, That's a key indication that the trout are chasing smelt, chasing bait fish, or are some other form of a, you know, a fast moving food item. Okay, And smelt and, and bait fish are the key ones there. Galaxias, minnows and so forth. So a crashy rise tells you that a trout is chasing something very quickly. A lot of the times they'll be down do it, but there's a lot of times where the smelt and the bait fish are moving and cruising just under the water, under the uh, surface. And when they trout charge them, they really make a lot of movement and a lot, and that's a key indication to it. Um, so that's a great one. So they are the rise forms, guys. Now let's watch this film footage showing you some rise forms. Haven't got them all there, but there are some. And they're a great indicator um, and help us with our fly fishing. Yeah, got that. Got them taken off the top too. <laughs> right. Yeah, he just took off the top then. No, no, he took a little yellow yeah, thing. I wonder if he's taking a little beetle. Well, Okay, so continuing on, we now come to another tactic which we uh, can have great success with, and that is observation of wildlife. And there's two forms, guys. There's the first form, which is animals that feed on trout food, all right? And those animals are mainly birds, okay? Now, the old saying goes, the birds in the sky are the fisherman's eye. A fantastic saying, so true. Now, probably the greatest number of birds, or the greatest um, bird, is the swallows. All right, that we see on our lakes and on our rivers. When you see the swallows feeding, that's a great indication that they're taking some form of insect. Now, it could be mayfly duns, it could be spinners, it could be caddis, it could be midges. All right. It could be a whole host of different insects. So if you do see swallows swooping down, hitting the, uh, the surface of the water, that's a great indication that they're on some type of insect or there's an insect hatch occurring. And when you see that, make a beeline to that area and observe and find out what they're actually taking and then do all the corresponding um, actions after that. All right. 
terns, people don't realise terns actually feed on a lot of insects on our lakes. All right? So that's uh, one to remember. Swans, they're a type of bird. They actually, you know, they'll paddle around the lake and they'll, you know, dip their bill under the water surface in amongst the weed beds and so forth, looking for sort of like damselflies, mud eyes, um, um, bait fish and so forth. So swans can be a great indicator to the trout uh, food that could be available. Coots are another one. Dab chicks, very small birds. Same thing, they sort of like, you know, dip under the uh, surface and, you know, your dab chicks will go under for, you know, geez, up to a minute, you know. They'll swim down, take whatever is available and then come back up. They're a great indicator, okay. And water rats, all right, water rats. You know, they love to feed on mud eyes. They love to feed on crustaceans. They love to feed on bait fish, all right. So if you see water rats in any number on a lake, make a blue line to it or fish that area. Observe and try and find out what that water rat is actually feeding on, okay? So they're the main animals that um, feed on trout food, all right? So observe them, guys. Now, the next form is the animals that feed on trout, okay? Now, there's two main ones that I'm just mainly concerned with, and you probably know this, is pelicans and cormorants, all right? Pelicans, they take a lot of trout, guys, redfin and trout. And um, I remember one time down at uh, Lake Murderjook, uh, back in its heyday when uh, the fish were going berserk down there, um, pelicans were taking trout that were that big, I couldn't believe it. I saw one that would have had to be eight pounds. It was in the pelican's bag and the tail was coming out the mouth. It was massive and I just couldn't believe this pelican could eat a trout that big. But they can, guys. So a small trout is easy. You know, it's like lollies for them, okay? Cormorids, well, I don't know if you've seen many trout with scars on their flanks and scars on their back. That's cormorids, guys. They've been attacked but survived it. But a lot don't survive and they get taken by the cormorids. So if you see cormorids on a lake, on a river, all right, make a beeline for that area and you'll be in business. Now, continuing on, our next observation tactic that we need to employ or will give us a great deal of help is our observation tools, all right? Now, there's two main ones that I'm going to discuss. Those observation tools are, firstly, Polaroid sunglasses, all right? Using Polaroid sunglasses, uh, for those that are not in the know, Polaroid sunglasses cut the glare off the water surface and allow the fly fishing to be able to see into the water. And it's amazing what you can actually see. You can see structures of rivers and lakes. You can see all the different weed beds within a lake. You can see channels. You can see a whole host of different things. And above all, you can see trout feeding. And it is quite spectacular, let me tell you. Um, it's just amazing what you can see. And your Polaroid sunglasses need to be of good quality. Um, get yourself um, glass uh, uh, lenses and um, also photochromatic. So what that means is they uh, lighten when uh, there's um, too much light and they darken when there's a lot of light and this can help. Um, with the quality of the polarization. Um, there are a number of different brands out there. Tonic is probably one of the um, um, better brands out there. Um, good quality glasses and they also do prescription. So if you've got uh, normal glasses um, and you've got a certain prescription, they can actually cater for that and so you'll be able to see um, beautifully um, when you're fly fishing along our lakes and our streams. Another great aspect too is to have a broad rimmed hat so that we can create a bit of a shadow over 
the sunglasses, that also aids in our Polaroiding. Now, I'll show you some footage here of where Polaroid sunglasses really work well and how you can actually see into the uh, or through the river water, in this case the river water. Um, yeah, great footage guys, watch this. You know how you can do 10x? You can't record. Oh, you can't record? No. Yeah. He's going to swing around. Yeah, I seen him really good there. Did he? Did you yeah, see that? Yeah, really clear. Wow. Uh, he's, yeah, he's come back to me. Huh? Yeah, I can see him. Yeah, yeah. Like yep, I can oh, see him. Yes, we've got it, we've got it on footage. Yeah, here he comes now. I can see him. Yep. You want to get a Polaroid filled with the rest? Well, yeah, I will. There you go. Oh, that's oh, good footage. Good Perfect. footage. Yeah. You get that? Just keep filming him. There's not footage of him. Yeah, the uh, camera's picking us up, picking us up talking. Oh, I can, I so can get rid of it. I can get there. Yeah. Yeah. You think he spooks, but he's not. He just like goes quickly when he comes back in. Yeah, it's good because you see he's very calm. Oh, yeah. Where's he gonna run? I don't know. Try and get at least one chance. Chance one, I reckon. There he comes now. I can see it really clearly on the camera. Now another form of observation tool is binoculars. Now I'm not talking about getting a big clumsy pair of binoculars the size of a, you know, a punter at the race course. No, you can actually get very small binoculars probably fit in the palm of your hand, okay? Very small. Or you can even get monoculars, right? which is just a, a single lens. And they can aid you a lot, especially if you're a long distance. As I talked to you before, you might see swallows working all right, with a pair of monoculars or small binoculars. You can actually look into them and you can actually see what the trout may be feeding on. How if they're hitting the uh, water surface and a whole host of different uh, um, activity uh, on our lakes. So binoculars are also a great observation tool guys. I can highly recommend it. Okay guys, so in conclusion, all right, we need to realize that if we want to have the greatest success with our fly fishing, we need to observe. Observation. I can't stress it any harder, all right? Really watch the water with your tactics in fly fishing. It's absolutely imperative. The old saying, look, watch and listen that's so important we look and then we watch and now do they mean the same thing no they don't guys we can look but are we actually watching are we actually knowing what's going on are we actually seeing the action that's happened are we are we figuring it out all right that's what we talk about there when we look watch and of course listen that's just common sense guys there's lots of sounds that we'll hear that can be uh, indicators as to trout movement or trout feeding and so forth. So guys, I hope you have enjoyed uh, this presentation and um, I will have my email address in the description below um, that if you want, you can send me your email address and I'll send you a article um, entitled observation which talks has the written form of everything I've talked about here so you can get more details 
in regards to that guys if need be so just send me uh, your email address and I'll send that out to you no problems in the world so uh, this is Bruce Smith saying goodbye and um, I'll see you in the next edition of fly fishing in nature's realm bye for now Thank <laughs> you.